Hello, everyone. Welcome to the biggest ideas in the universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll, and this is the Q&A video associated with idea number 11, which was renormalization. This, of course, was in a video that gave me an excuse to talk about effective field theories, the Wilsonian approach to renormalization, which says, you tell me some ultraviolet cutoff, some energy scale above which I don't pretend to know what is happening, and that I can give you a description of the infrared physics. I can give you a description of what's happening at low energies to particles with masses and momenta below that cutoff without knowing anything about what's going on in the very, very short distances, the very, very high energies. So we got some pretty good questions here. So I think I'm just going to do a straightforward kind of Q&A thing, try to address some of these questions. And, you know, I'm going to rephrase them into my own terms. So one question, I'm not even quite sure how to phrase it as a question, but it basically has to do with the status of virtual particles. Uh, are virtual particles real things? Uh, do they really exist? Are they really popping in and out of existence? A lot of times, a few times, I think, uh, this was phrased in the context of black holes and Hawking radiation, which we're not talking about yet. We'll get there eventually. Uh, there will be black holes in the future, but right now we're just in flat space time and ordinary quantum field theory, so let's stay there for this discussion. Um, are virtual particles real? Well, it kind of depends on what you mean by real. I mean, think about um, this idea that we had where two particles come in, and there's a blob of stuff, and then two particles go out. In fact, let's make this two electrons coming in, okay? Uh, no, let's make an electron and a positron coming in. So the electron-ness goes in that way and out that way because a positron can be thought of as an electron going backward in time, and an electron and positron come out. I think I did emphasize this already, but, you know, the arrows here are not directions of travel. This is not the momentum of the particle. This is the direction of the electronness, which travels in one direction for an electron moving one way and travels opposite for the positron moving the same way. And we said, look, this is a process. This is what you want to know the answer to. What is the probability that this happens? And we write it as a sum of different things happening, right? So one possibility is there's a photon interchanged like this. And I'll draw the arrows just this once. But there are other possibilities. So here's a possibility that the uh, electrons go in, turn into photons, and then come out. So here's electronness going this way. And here it is going this way. And there's many, many other contributions. There's an infinite number of contributions. So the point of this is we start with some configuration of quantum fields that look particle-like. So there's a wave function for the quantum fields, and it's localized in two different positions, one with an electron field vibrating, the other with a positron field vibrating. They come in nearby, they overlap, all sorts of different fields vibrate, like the photon field, this is the electromagnetic field, gamma, the photon that is contributing to this interaction, and then they go their own way, they separate out once again. So the statement that we make is that this process can be calculated by thinking of these Feynman diagrams with virtual particles inside and then summing over all the contributions we get from all the virtual particles. So the question is, will all the virtual particles real? Well, uh, the process is real and we have a way of calculating that process. In some sense, what's real are the quantum fields. Uh, in fact, in some sense, what is real is the wave function of the universe. And the wave function of the universe describes all these quantum fields, but it is the thing that is real in some very vague sense. So you have to have a more sophisticated notion of what you mean by real. One attitude or one thing to notice is um, if this process is a sum over all of these Feynman diagrams, then no one of these Feynman diagrams is the single real thing. Right? These Feynman diagrams are individual contributions to the real thing. So in some sense, no, these virtual particles are not real. They are part of a story that we tell. Uh, but the story gives us the right answer. And the story, you know, when you tell a story in physics and say, well, this is what the story we're telling uh, has involved and it leads to this conclusion, there's a sense in which that's real, right? There's a sense in which as long as it gives us the right answer, it's real. So in other words, what I'm saying here is kind of don't get hung up 
on the idea of whether or not the virtual particles are real or not. The process is real, the quantum fields that are in the wave function of the universe are real, the virtual particles are a way of telling us what happens to them. They're not fake, they're not a mistake, it's not an illusion, it's not like there's something that's actually happening, the virtual particles are a wrong way of talking about it, but they are a way of talking about it. This does become a little bit more, um, th there's a closely related question, which is what about when you don't have a scattering process? What about when you have some process that is simply static? Like, let's say we have a hydrogen atom, okay, that is just sitting there. So hydrogen atom, we're able to uh, say, okay, here's a proton, P plus, and there's an electron. Let me see if I can do this correctly. Yeah. The electron we can think of as a wave function that is spread out, right? And that's a cloud of electron, E minus. And that's how we would discuss it in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, okay? And in quantum field theory, we would say, well, there are fields and they give rise in the right limit, in the right sort of approximation to part of the wave function describing a single proton, part of the wave function describing a single electron, and they're interacting. So there is a Feynman diagram way of talking about this. And that is, you can say that this hydrogen atom can be thought of in, you know, in time, it's not changing, right? It's just sitting there. But here is an electron with its electronness flowing in this direction. Here is a proton with its protonness floating, uh, flowing in that direction. And what's happening is that the electron and the proton are exchanging photons, okay? Virtual particles, photons. Time is running this way. But in some sense, there are little virtual particle photons, gamma, being exchanged back and forth between the electron and the proton. This is a way, not the only way, not necessarily the best way, but a way of thinking about how to calculate the properties of the electron in the hydrogen atom. But the important thing to notice here is, of course, so there is in that hydrogen atom, even though I didn't draw it, there's an electromagnetic field as well as an electron and a positron, but nothing is changing over time. The wave function, which you can actually solve for just in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you don't need quantum field theory or Feynman diagrams to do it, but you could use them. The wave function is static. It is constant over time. The story we tell about the electron and the positron in the Feynman diagram language is a sum of many, many things. Every one of those things is not constant in time, right? Here is a diagram four little photons going back and forth. And in the same time period, you have another diagram with one photon, another with two and three, and many other diagrams with crisscross and, and so forth. So we sum up all of these dynamical processes in time, represented by individual Feynman diagrams, to get us an answer which is time independent, which is just sitting there and static. So it is more real to talk about what the wave function of the electron, the photon, and the proton are doing, than to talk about the individual Feynman diagrams of which they're made. So you can tell a story of the electron bound to the proton as a story of virtual photons popping in and out of existence, traveling back and forth between the electron and the proton, and binding the electron, causing a force. As I did in the renormalization video, you can even use that story to sort of justify how we talk about renormalization, right? The cloud of virtual particles around the electron kind of fades away as you get further away. There's a shielding effect that makes the net charge of the electron look a little bit less if you're far away from it than if you're nearby. These are all stories you can tell, but they're stories that, remember, are describing a static thing, okay? So there are not truly dynamical virtual particles popping in and out of existence in this situation. There's not anything bubbling beneath the surface. If you were to observe it, if you were to take some, I don't know, really, really good microscope, okay, and take this hydrogen atom and say, where is the electron? Well, then you're doing something different. You're disturbing the system because you're measuring it, right? In the, in the language we talked about before, you're interacting with it, and you're becoming entangled with it, so you're changing its wave function. So you would never see this electron wave function spread out. This goes back to the discussion we had about quantum mechanics. Quantum field theory is just part of quantum mechanics, and it's the same discussion. There is something that is happening when we're not looking at it, which is the electron has a static wave function, nothing is changing over time, and something you would see were you to look at it.
So if you were to look for the electron, you would see it in some location. If you were to reset the electron back to its lowest energy state, to look again, you would see it in some different location. Likewise, if you could somehow measure the photon or the electromagnetic field, you would see values for that. And every time you looked, you would see it a little bit different because you're sampling in different ways from some probability distribution, okay? So if you look over and over again, you get a picture over time as if the electron is jiggling around. But that's not what's happening when you're not looking at it. When you're not looking at it, everything is perfectly static. So this is a situation where the story we tell of an, uh, virtual particles popping in and out of existence is misleading. There is nothing that is different from one moment of time to another moment of time. There's no, no sense in which you can say at one moment of time there are three virtual photons and another moment there are four virtual photons. That is a nonsensical statement. The wave function of all three of these things, the proton, the electron, and the photon, they are static. They're the same at every moment in time. So I hope that helps a little bit in trying to figure out how we should talk about these particles. You know, by the way, this goes into the next thing we'll talk about. You can even tell the story of Feynman diagrams for a single particle. Remember, I drew the picture of an electron with virtual particles popping in and out of space around it. So we can talk about the propagator for a single particle. The propagator is a way of talking about just a single particle all by itself moving through space. Okay, so here's an electron moving through space. There it is. A very simple Feynman diagram, right? But in some sense, this is equal to a whole bunch of different things. It's equal to the electron really did just go all by itself, plus the electron is going all by itself, but it emitted a photon and then it reabsorbed the photon. That's something that could happen. Plus, the electron's going all by itself and it emitted a photon and it emitted another photon and they cross each other. Plus, the electron's going all by itself, but then it emits a photon, and then the photon turns into an electron-positron pair, and then they annihilate, and then they get reabsorbed by the photon, plus it's, oops, by the electron, plus etc. So this is a Feynman diagram way of talking about just a single particle. And you know, time is running left to right, but the electron doesn't even have to be moving, right? The electron could just be literally sitting there, and we would describe it as an infinite sum of Feynman diagrams. So to calculate what's going on, the virtual particles are very useful, but the true thing that is going on is there is a field that is vibrating, and all the other fields that it interacts with vibrate along with it. That's what's really happening, okay? Um, and the vibrations might be static. In other words, the vibrations might be a certain shape. I don't, when I say vibrate, I don't necessarily mean literally changing in time. Sorry about that. I mean there is a shape, a profile to the wave function that may or may not be changing in time. Which brings us to the next question, which I think is a little bit harder for me to answer, which is how do fields interact? I think that this is one of those questions that arises because um, we have sort of a built-in intuitive idea for what we mean by things interacting with each other. And that idea doesn't quite apply to fields or something like this. Um, when people say, how do the fields interact? You know, what kind of answer could you possibly be hoping <laughs> to get? So if you, if you say, well, the Earth interacts with the Sun gravitationally, what you mean is you have the Earth and the Sun, and there's a gravitational field in between, and, you know, both the Earth and the Sun create and respond to the gravitational field, and there you go. So if you say, well, how do fields interact themselves? I'm tempted to just say, you know, that's what they do. <laughs> Remember, what's the way that we're describing things, again, the most fundamental description would just be the wave function of the universe. But the wave function of the universe assigns different amplitudes to fields doing different things. So at every point in space, there's a bunch of fields, okay? At every point in space, you know, in, in some way, in some ways you can you can think about it like this. So here is space. Space. And at every point, there are multiple fields that exist. So what you might want to do is draw them as a series of different copies of space. And it looks like they're on top of each other, but I separated them out just so I could draw them. But really, it's exactly the same copy of space. And here you have the electron field. Let's call it E minus of x. Here you have the photon field, gamma of x. Here you have the proton field. It could be the positron field. Every single field exists. 
In fact, let's do that. This is p plus of x. Let's put the positron here. Positron field. There's also the gravitational field, etc. This is e plus of x. So the point is, I've drawn four different copies of space, but they're the same space, they're the same location, uh, the same representation of the three-dimensional space in which we live. And the rules of the game, given by the locality of the dynamics of the fields, are that these fields can interact in the sense that the value of the field or the derivatives of the field at one point in space can interact and be influenced by and influence the values of the other fields at the same point. So that is encompassed in what we talked about in, the in I guess, uh, the second to last video on interactions in the Lagrangian for the field. So you have an action, S, which is an integral over time, dt of L, that's the Lagrangian. And then you have the Lagrangian L is written as an integral over space, so that's d3x, the three dimensions of space, of a Lagrange density. And the Lagrange density is itself a function of all these fields. So e minus of x, uh, gamma of x, and t. I'm, I'm uh, assuming that time is in there as well as space. p plus, the proton field, e plus, the positron field and so on. I don't know what, why that keeps happening. Okay, but the point is that the Lagrangian, Lagrange density is going to look like a product, a, a sum of products of fields where the fields are evaluated at the same point of space-time. So there might be something that says E minus e, sorry, let me be very specific, is the whole point, e minus of x, e plus of x, gamma of x. And real particle physicists in the audience know that I'm hiding a lot of details here. There are indices, there are spinners and vectors and the whole bit, just subsuming all that. But the point is this kind of term in the interaction Lagrangian for the fields says that an electron and a positron can interact with the photon. And this leads to a Feynman diagram that looks like uh, this. E minus, E plus, gamma. And different kinds of terms in Lagrangian give rise to different Feynman diagrams. But the crucial thing is they're all evaluated at the same point in space. You never have e minus of x times e plus of y, where x and y are different from each other, okay? That's the notion of locality. And this, the reason why I'm reiterating all this, I've said it all before, is because this term in the interaction Lagrangian tells us the interaction of the fields. This tells us how the fields influence each other. This says that if I have an electron field vibrating and a photon field vibrating, that can influence the vibration of the positron field and vice versa, all the different combinations that you might have. And if you wanna say, well, how are they interacting? Like, what does it mean that they're interacting? It, that's all it means. I don't, I don't know what else to say. That's what fields do. Fields affect each other in accordance with this kind of set of equations of motion. Remember, the whole point of the action in the action formulation of mechanics or the Lagrangian or whatever is from all these different expressions, you can derive the full equations of motion classically, or you could derive the full Schrodinger equation quantum mechanically. So you can tell us how the fields evolve. So that, that's the point of quantum field theory. There's no deeper level. There's no answer to the question, well, the fields interact by exchanging handshakes or baseballs or something like that or shocking each other or I don't even know what it would be. The fields, by their very existence, by their behavior at different locations in space, affect what other fields are doing. That is manifested in the equations of motion or in the Lagrangian or in the Schrodinger equation, the Hamiltonian, whichever language you want to use, but that is what is happening. There is no sort of deeper answer to the question, how are the fields interacting with each other? But I don't know. I don't know if that was a satisfying answer to that particular question, but that is the best I can do. Okay. Um, oh yeah, uh, the renormalization group. This is the next question. This is something I mentioned, but I think it's not that I'm answering a question about it. It's just I'm going to say the same thing that I tried to say before, but I'm going to say it again in slightly different language. Hopefully uh, it will 
be a little bit more clear what is going on here. The point is that Wilson, Ken Wilson tells us to put a cutoff on our Feynman diagrams. So we have a Feynman diagram, let's say that just it looks like a generic box like this. And we have a certain amount of energy is going in. And then we have what, what I called E bar, which is a certain amount of energy that is going around the loop. So E bar is not specified just by the boundary conditions of what the energy coming in here, E1, E2, E3. I forget how we labeled them before, E4, probably the other way around, it doesn't matter. There's an unspecified amount of energy that goes through the loop. So therefore you sum over all the possible values of E bar. And what Wilson says is you sum only up to some value of the energy, right? It can't go above some energy and that's the ultraviolet cutoff. The worry is when you do that, that who says what the cutoff is supposed to be? Like if I did a different cutoff, then wouldn't I get a different answer? Because the, let me see if I can do this, move this around. There we go. So the process that we're looking at, represented by this diagram as a whole, is the sum over all values of E bar of the individual diagrams for this. So surely, if we add up the contributions of every different value of E bar, the energy running through the loop, if I change the range over which I do that sum, then I should get a different answer, right? I'm including some extra stuff or I'm not. And the point of the renormalization group was, well, what we can do is we have coupling constants, like, let's say, the fine structure constants, fine structure constant, alpha, okay? Alpha equals 137, we usually say. What Wilson reveals to us, and actually this is built on work that was done earlier by Murray Gilman, Francis Lowe, and other people, um, you should think of the fine structure constant not as a constant, but as something that depends on your ultraviolet cutoff, and I forget what I called it, E star. This is what I'm going to call it in, in this video anyway. This is the cutoff. The point of what Wilson says is, um, and different again, different people have said different versions of this, but the point is, yes, if I change my cutoff, then I'm adding a different set of Feynman diagrams together. But in every, every diagram, in each diagram, at all these vertices, I have a factor that is related to the coupling constant. In particular, in uh, QED, in quantum electrodynamics, every vertex comes with the square root of alpha in it, the charge of the electron in a, another way of thinking about it. So what I can do is change the cutoff and also change all my coupling constants to compensate. That's what this notation means, alpha as a function of E star, the cutoff. I can get the same answer at the end of the day, the same answer for this question, what is the probability that an electron and a positron scatter off each other, no matter what my cutoff is, by choosing the value of the fine structure constant, the renormalized value of the fine structure constant appropriately. And the miracle, so you, of course you can do that once, right? For one process, for an electron and a positron coming in, then bouncing off of each other, I could always just by hand choose a value of alpha so I get whatever answer I want as a function of, of the cutoff. But the nice thing is you only do it once. Once you have that coupling constant as a function of energy, the same function, the same alpha as a function of the cutoff energy works for any process, not just an electron scattering off a positron, but an electron scattering off of another electron or an electron positron annihilating into two photons or two, pho two photons creating an electron and positron or two electrons and two protons. All the different processes you can imagine can be described by the same renormalized cutoff. That is the miracle of effective field theory. And this is called the renormalization group. The renormalization group is simply how the different coupling constants change as you change the coupling constant. For those of you know, those of you who know what a group is, a group in mathematics is sort of a set of things you can add together or multiply together. And there is a, an inverse and there's a whole, there's, you know, there's different sets of uh, restrictions for what a group is. The renormalization group is not really a group at all, but the name uh, was given to it and it stuck. The renormalization group is how you change your coupling constants as you change your cutoff so that your infrared low energy processes get the same answer. And so I think that's answering the questions as well as I could. I mean, the questions were basically how in the world can this work? 
this is how it works. I think I tried to say this uh, in the previous video, but I'm not sure I did a good job. So that is my that is my attempt at doing a better job. Okay, here's something that wasn't quite a question, but it was kind of implied by a question. Um, effective field theory, EFT. I said that an effective field theory is a way of talking about what happens at, at low energies, given a certain cutoff. You say, I admit, I don't know what happens at arbitrarily low energies, but I have a, a theory for my low energy stuff that is effective, that is good enough, okay? Um, what I didn't say, but is true, or I don't remember saying it anyway, is that effective field theories can, what's the best way to say this? Let's just dive in. Can have different ontologies. <laughs> Remember, I talked about, um, I have talked about in the past, I'm sorry, I've been talking so much recently between the podcast and the videos and so forth that I forget what I've said and what I haven't. Um, I don't think I did say this. There's something called emergence, the emergence of a description of physical reality at a higher level. So you have a box of gas is a very typical thing to have describing by the language of emergence. We know that inside the box of gas, there are atoms, there are molecules, they're bumping into each other. So we can describe what's going on by in principle, listing every position and every momentum and every orientation of every atom and also the identity of every atom. Is it oxygen or is it a carbon dioxide molecule or whatever? But there's another way of talking about what's going on inside the box, the emergent way of talking about it as a fluid, right? It has a certain density at every point in space, a certain pressure, a certain temperature, a certain net velocity, all these different things. And what you say is that I can describe the gas using a fluid within a certain domain of validity or a certain domain of applicability. I can't do it if there's only one atom in the box and it does not have a fluid description, but if there are a lot of atoms in the box, if there are Avogadro's number or more, then I can describe it using, using this fluid description. And the interesting thing about that is that the fluid description is perfectly good. It gives the same predictions within its domain of applicability as the atom and molecule description does. It's not as comprehensive. There are circumstances where there's small numbers of atoms or molecules where it doesn't work, but when it works, it works just as well, up to some level of approximation. So it's kind of an effective field theory, right? Like I didn't derive it using Feynman diagrams or anything like that, but in some broad sense, talking about a whole bunch of atoms and molecules as a fluid is a low energy approximate effective field theory. Because it's you know, a fluid is a field. A fluid has all these different things at every point in space. It interacts with itself locally, et cetera, et cetera. So the interesting part of that, the reason why I'm bringing it up, is because not only are the equations governing what the gas is doing different in the language of particles versus the language of a fluid, the stuff is different. It's a fluid. It's not a set of individual particles. So what's that? what that's saying is the effective field theory need not describe the same fields as whatever is going on underneath. And we see this in particle physics all the time. So we haven't gone into the details about um, quarks and gluons and QCD, but you know you have you know protons, okay? And you know that a proton can be thought of. Here's a big proton as a combination of three quarks. There's an up quark, another up quark, and a down quark, and they're interacting through gluons. The gluons are doing different things. Gluons can interact with each other. We'll get to this. We'll talk about it eventually. And the gluons interact in different ways. There's complicated Feynman diagrams because, you know, gluons are complicated. Lots of things going on, okay? So, the way to think about this is, as, is in the language of effective field theories. There is a scale, the QCD scale, which is about 0 0.3 GeV, where the mass of the proton is about 1 GeV. A GeV, remember, is a billion electron volts. The mass of the proton is about 1 GeV. So the point is the QCD scale is the scale at which the strong interactions become strong. Just like electromagnetism, there's a coupling constant for the strong interactions. It changes with energy scale, just like the coupling constant for electromagnetism does. But unlike electromagnetism, where the closer you get to the electron, the stronger the fine structure constant seems, the charge of the electron is. Uh, so the higher energy, the stronger the interaction is. QCD works the other way around. 
At high energies, the interactions are weak. At low energies, they're strong. And the QCD scale is the scale at which energies become so strong that the effective fine structure constant becomes greater than one. And remember when we did all that Feynman diagram stuff, we said we had perturbation theory. It only makes sense because more complicated diagrams have more factors of alpha. They get smaller and smaller as you multiply them together. If the effective alpha you have, like you do in the strong interactions, is one or greater, then this idea of doing perturbation theory and adding up a bunch of Feynman di diagrams just doesn't work anymore. You're not going to get a sensible answer. It's just not the right technique. The field theory still works, but the Feynman diagram approach to solving problems in it doesn't work anymore. So what do you do? What you do is you say that above the QCD scale, if you're looking at energies above that scale, you can talk the language of quarks and gluons. The quarks are the matter particles. They are held together by the force particles, gluons, that are the strong interaction version of photons. But below the QCD scale, energies lower than this, okay, roughly speaking, mass of the proton, if we ignore factors of one third, um, you can't talk that language anymore. But what you can do is talk a language of protons and neutrons and pions and all the other strongly interacting particles. So those fields become the important fundamental ingredients of that effective field theory. So there's an effective field theory of strongly interacting particles, protons, neutrons, pions, etc., below the QCD scale. And there's a field theory of quarks and gluons above the QCD scale. Now, it so happens that the theory of quarks and gluons, QCD, quantum chromo chromodynamics, is one of the rare quantum field theories that we think could be extended infinitely far, infinitely far in energy. In other words, if it weren't for gravity, if it weren't for electromagnetism and all those annoying forces of nature, if the world were just quantum chromodynamics, we would have the full theory. We would have the ultraviolet complete theory of nature. You can actually do calculations to arbitrarily high energies in QCD, which you can't do in QED or quantum gravity, etc. But putting that aside, uh, the point is at different energies with different cutoffs, not only do you have different values of coupling constants, you have a different set of fields entirely. That's what we mean by the ontology here, the set of fields that are making up your theory. So effective field theory is powerful and flexible enough to let you say that if I'm at high energies, my fields of my theory are quarks and gluons. At lower energies, the fields of my theory are protons and neutrons and pions, etc. So that's what effective field, that's another thing that effective field theories allow you to do. Okay, last question I have here, which is kind of related. Um, the effective field theory of general relativity or gravity. The specific question that, that really caught my eye was relativity. I spelled it right. Look at that. Uh, the specific question was, can you actually reconstruct the successful empirical behavior such as the gravitational redshift just from an effective field theory of gravity? So gravitational redshift is um, if you, here's the earth, <laughs> here's the ground, and you built a tower, and at the top of the tower you have an experimenter. So here's a tower, and what you're going to do is you're going to shine a flashlight so you have some flashlight or some laser tuned to some very, very specific frequency, okay? So it's only giving off a particular frequency of light. So you shine a photon up there, and the point is that if it moves against the gravitational field, if it's climbing out of the gravitational field, the frequency that is observed by the observer at a high altitude is a lower frequency, a longer wavelength redshifted. Okay, This is one of the first predictions of general relativity that Einstein himself made. It was not actually um, measured until decades later. The Pound-Rebka experiment is a famous example, and these days we've measured it in a variety of contexts. Now, what you will find if you read a general relativity book, such as the one that I wrote, Space, Time, and Geometry, what you will find is that this existence of the gravitational redshift is used as an argument in favor of thinking of gravity as a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. Okay, So you might say, well, all right, there's this experiment, I did it, I made a prediction, but I, I didn't see any words in there about geometry or metrics or curvature or anything like that. What does that have to do with anything? Uh, but there's an argument because basically what you can draw some triangles and some rectangles and, and 
make an argument with rocket ships that you know are accelerating and say the only way that I could possibly explain what's going on here is to change the geometry of space-time itself. Okay, and I'm not going to rehearse that argument because we haven't talked about gravity yet, but it exists. So that seems naively to be in conflict with the claim that you can just think of gravity as a field theory in some background flat space-time. So the effective field theory of general relativity says um, gravity, the gravitational field, what, what should I say? Gravity equals flat space-time plus an appropriate gravitational field. And it works out that the gravitational field is a tensor. It's basically a metric tensor. It, uh, it's a, it, the technical terms, which we'll get to later, are it is a symmetric two-index tensor field. Okay. It is not just the simple Laplace gravitational potential. It's more complicated than that, but it serves the same purpose as Laplace's gravitational potential field. Okay. So this is the EFT perspective, and. The question is, how do you reconcile these two claims? One claim is the empirical existence of gravitational redshift is evidence that we should think of gravity as the curvature of space-time. The second claim is, in the effective field theory language, we don't need to have curved space-time. We can have flat space-time, and on top of it, we can have a gravitational field. The answer is, you know, it's a little bit subtle, and, and many of you who are not, you know, already in, uh, immersed in these issues might not uh, care or, or um, see why we should care. But the point is, uh, yes, they're perfectly compatible with each other because of the specific properties that this gravitational field has. So the claim that I want to make, so forget about the details, I'll try to get into a detail, but the take home message is, um, as long as you are in the weak field regime, as long as you are in the regime of gravity where curvature of space time is not too strong, so that means you're nowhere near a black hole, you're nowhere near the Big Bang, maybe not even near a neutron star. Um, but otherwise, if you're talking about the Earth, the Sun, gravitational waves, all these other things that we observe in our local neighborhood, gravity is very, very weak. It's a weak force. And in that regime, I want to claim the effective field theory of general relativity as a quantum field theory works totally well. You just have to stay away from the cutoff where gravity becomes strong. Okay, how do you reconcile that? Well, it's because of the actual properties of this gravitational field. And I, I tried to think about you know how I could explain this in equations given what we already know, and it's hard to do, so I'm not going to do it. But I'm going to try to just say it in words. The point is that um, gravity is special because gravity is a source of gravity. This is uh, something that would not have been true for Newton, but is true in general relativity. So in the language of the effective field theory, you know, in the, in the language of general relativity itself, the way Einstein wrote it down, you know, Einstein wrote this complicated nonlinear set of equations for the gravitational field, and there's no sense in those equations that it looks like gravity is the source of gravity. But here we're doing something different. We're starting with flat space-time, And we're imagining that on top of that, there's a gravitational field, just like all those other fields that we drew, right? The gravitational field. And in this language, that gravitational field, that is just a small ripple because we're in the weak field, it interacts not only with every other field, but it also interacts with itself. So those are, those are two separate statements, and they're both very, very important. Gra the gravitational field interacts with everything, and it interacts universally with everything. So it interacts in the same way with electrons and positrons and protons and neutrons. The strength of the interaction is proportional to the mass or the energy of the thing being interacted with, but the net effect is exactly the same. So this goes back to Galileo, right? Galileo dropping two different objects with different masses off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He probably never did that, but he did equivalent experiments. Galileo was the one who showed that gravity has this universal aspect. Things fall at the same rate in a gravitational field. And Einstein did thought experiments with elevators and so forth to show the same thing. In this language, 
that fact that gravity is universal, that has the same effect on everything, including photons that will gravitationally redshift, implies that there's a very, very specific way that you need to construct the effective field theory for gravity. There's a very, very specific way that the gravitational field can couple, can interact with all the other fields, including itself. So you don't have a lot of freedom. You're incredibly tightly constrained by things like the redshift, gravitational redshift experiment, the equivalence principle, different objects follow different rates, all that stuff. And so it turns out, and this is the miracle, when you say, well, I have a field with certain properties that kind of looks like gravity, and I insist that it couples to everything, including itself, in a way such that everything is universal, then that fixes not just the simple interaction you write down, but the entire infinite set of interactions in your effective field theory. Okay, up to some cutoff, of course, you always have the cutoff, but there's no arbitrariness. There is a way that everything has to couple together. And so if the, if the gravitational field is usually written as H of X, for reasons which we don't have to go into right now, and there's a Lagrangian that involves H of X, multiplying the electron field and the photon field and everything else. And this rule of universal coupling specifies all the different ways that H can appear in that Lagrangian. And it turns out this was work done by people like Steven Weinberg and Richard Feynman. Uh, you know, they're, they're less famous work, but they did this. Uh, Stanley Dezer also made arguments to this effect. That whole different infinite set of interactions between the gravitational effective field theory field um, and everything else can be summarized uniquely into Einstein's equations for gravity, the whole nonlinear non mess that even gives you black holes in the Big Bang and all that stuff. So because gravity is so highly constrained, this gravitational field that you would think of as the effective thing that is propagating on flat space-time has to interact in a very, very specific way such that it is equivalent to saying that the geometry of space-time itself is being affected. So these are two different languages to say the same thing. Einstein would say what's going on is that space-time has a geometry, everything just feels that geometry and reacts to it, the effective field theorist says there's a gravitational field that has an interaction Lagrangian that has coupling constants that work in certain ways. It turns out they are saying exactly the same thing in different languages. Now, Einstein's language is a little bit more general because it actually applies to black holes and things like this. You can work to apply this kind of language to black holes in some sense, but Einstein is more flexible. So this is, again, an effective field theory. It has a certain domain of applicability. But it reproduces all of the geometric predictions of Einstein, all the equivalence principle stuff, all of the arguments that you should think of gravity as the curvature of space-time do have analogs in this way of thinking, as gravity is not the curvature of space-time. But it's because it secretly is. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, even though the language is not gravity is the curvature of space-time, it's a really, really complicated and awkward-looking way of summarizing the fact that the gravity is actually the curvature of space-time. So this is yet another testament to the power of effective field theories. There, there are things that we don't know, things that we don't know, like gravity near the Planck scale or near high curvature regimes, that, you, that do not prevent you from using effective field theories at low energies. It's an incredibly powerful tool for thinking about the world, and uh, until we do have the theory of everything, it's the best we got.